It's um, you checking us out? We we good. Apex First Baptist Church. Good evening. It is Wednesday night, so you know what that means. It's time for Bible study. And listen, I am so excited. We are live from the sanctuary, and we just thank God for every single person that thought it not Robbie to be here tonight and to um, tune in live and online. So again, go ahead and tell your neighbors, your co-workers, let them know that Apex First Baptist TV is on the air. God has a word for us tonight. We're going to have a really good time. And so let's go ahead and get your Bibles out. Go ahead and get something to write with. Make sure you have your notes and everything together as we get ready to hear from God. God's word says study to show yourself approved. And so we need to make sure that we can rightly divide that word of God. Not what Frankie McLean says, but what the word of God says. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to start with some announcements as we do all week. Listen, it is Easter Sunday. Come on, somebody. It is Easter Sunday. And... Um, we are so excited and cannot wait to see you on Easter Sunday. Last Easter Sunday, uh, we had folk from everywhere, and we just thank God, people from Greenville, Atlanta, uh, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, uh, Elizabeth City, Rayford, Charlotte, we're all here, Durham, Raleigh, Holly Springs, and we hope that you'll come back for our service. We have a dynamite service in store for you. God is going to move mightily. There is a word from the Lord. And don't forget, our Sunshine Band is going to be there. That's our young people. We just can't wait to see them. And I was told to tell all of our Sunshine Band to make sure that you are at church meeting Sister Archibald in the back by 10, 15 a.m. So all parents, please make sure you have your Sunshine Band here and ready to go. And immediately following our service. We're going to have our Easter egg hunt. And if you've never been in person for an Apex First Baptist Easter egg hunt, you have missed it. We're going to be throwing some bowls. There's going to be elbows thrown, swinging, but we're going to get to them eggs. Amen. And so we thank God for it. As our youth pastor, our former youth pastor, was throwing most of the bowls. So we thank God for that. So if you still want to make a donation, I think there's still time to make egg donations. So if you want to get them to the church soon, that'd be great. Uh, we still need those as many as we can get. Please stay away from peanuts and things like that, but if you want to put um, chocolate or candy in there, we would love to have those. So please join us immediately following service for our Easter egg hunt. Don't forget to join First Lady and I, 730 a.m. for our care and connection call every Friday morning. We want to hear your praise report, hear your prayer request, but more than that, we want to hear your voice and know that you're doing okay. So let's stay connected and join us every Friday morning at 7.30 a.m. for our care and connection call. Don't forget Sunday school. Somebody say Sunday school. Sunday school, Sunday mornings at 9.15 a.m. to 10.15 a.m. is a great time in God. Our education department does a phenomenal job. If you need a book or you just need to know how to get there, make sure you go to our website and get all the information there. But it is worth getting up early for, for our Bible study. Amen? Amen. I think that's it for all of our announcements. Um, let's, if you want to give, and we thank God for all of you that do, there are several ways you can give. If you're watching us online, you can go to our website, apexfbc.org forward slash give, and you can give that way. You can also stop by the church 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and give into our drop box. It's located on the second door on the left as you enter into the parking lot. Simply fill out the information, put it in the uh, drop box, and you can get your um, tithes and your offerings paid then. Or you can actually mail your gift to Apex First Baptist Church, P.O. Box 64, Apex, North Carolina, 27502. It's really simple. And maybe the simplest way is to go ahead and pick up your phone right now and text Apex First, all one word, to 73256. Again, Apex First, all one word, to 73256. Amen? Amen. Well, that's it right there for all of our announcements and all of our giving. And so let's go ahead and get started with the word of prayer like we always do, and then we'll get into this Bible study. Let us pray. Father God, we just want to say thank you. God, we thank you for this word that's going to come forth tonight. We thank you, God, that you're going to get Frankie out of the way so that you can get in the way, God. And so please use me mightily, God. Give us a word that's going to help us get through our daily lives. It's going to get us closer to you and better prepared to fight this demonic warfare that all of us have to go through from time to time. So we thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen and amen. So for the last two weeks, we've been talking about operating under the authority of God. Somebody say authority. Now, this is important, and I'm going to preach about this a little bit about this on Sunday, but you have to understand that as a child of God, you have authority. You have power. Come on, somebody. As a matter of fact, the Zuzia power, Dunamis power, Zuzia being the authority and Dunamis being the actual might of that power. But all of it, as we talked about last week, is derived authority. 
In other words, it's authority that God has delegated through us through his son, Jesus the Christ. In fact, it's really simple that as Gentiles, we were not uh, 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 originally intended to get the word, but since we've got it through our Gentileship, we've been adopted. And so as adopted children of God, we now have the same power as joint airship with Jesus Christ. Now that's important because it literally means that God has given us some abilities to speak things that call those things to be not as they were. He has given us the ability, the healing. That's why Isaiah says, by your stripes we are healed. So that means I ought to be able to believe God and speak a word. I ought to be able to believe God and bring healing to my life. I ought to be able to believe God and change my circumstances. Can I get a witness in here? Because of the derived authority that we've gotten from God. Now, the reason we're preaching about this is because literally there is an adversary that is on the prowl that is literally trying to take our joy, trying to take our peace. That's why John 10, 10 says, the thief comes but to kill, to steal, and to destroy, but I've come that you might have a life and have that life more abundantly. And I know you're watching this online and you can't see it, but right there in your hotel room, in your bedroom, or your kitchen, living room, wherever you're watching this here in the sanctuary, just raise your hand if you want an abundant life. If you want God to bless you abundantly above all you can think. But literally, the moment you begin to subscribe to that, you will also open yourself up to demonic attack. I'm preaching now. That's why the moment the devil realizes that you're about to take another step, that you're about to go to the next level, that you're about to open a door that he was hoping you would never get access to. Then all of a sudden the devil comes out and tries to attack that because he doesn't want you to enjoy your life. He doesn't want you to have joy. He doesn't want you to have peace. Come on, somebody. That's why if you're a child of God, sometimes it can feel like it's always something. And it always comes in a moment when you're trying to work your hardest, you're trying to do your best, you feel like all you're doing is giving, but every time you give and take two steps forward, you get knocked three steps back. I wish I had a preacher in here. And so that's when you got to lean on the authority that God has given you. And so what is this adversary? Who is this adversary? So last week, we gave you some different names. Just like God has names that point to his characteristics, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Raspa, Jehovah Tasbahot, Elohim, Yahweh, um, all of those names point to the characteristics of God. The devil, the enemy, the adversary has the same type of names. We said last week that he was called Satan, meaning he is the adversary of God, meaning that he is literally antagonistic to everything God wants to do. That's why God, if he says you're going to be the head, the devil is insistent that you're going to be the tail. Come on, somebody. If God has said you're going to be a lender, the devil will insist, no, you're going to be a borrower your whole life. If, if, if God has said you're going to be the first, the devil then, I'm preaching already, will make it his business to make sure, no, you are the last. Every good thing, Deacon Ellis, that God has spoke to you, over you, through you in your life, the devil has made it his business to make sure that that does not happen. And that's why you have to fight the wiles of the devil. That's why you have to resist the enemy. You you can't give in to him because first of all he is Satan or the adversary of God. That means every plan that God has he is antagonistic to that plan. Second he is the devil which means he is the slanderous one which means that his job is to uh, uh, diffuse the power of God's voice in your life. In other words if somebody comes to you and says God told me to tell you that he's about to bless you mightily if it doesn't happen by Thursday when you thought it was going to happen the devil will get in your ear and convince you that God does not care about you because if he did he wouldn't let you be in the situation you're in I'm preaching already he wouldn't let you be going through what you're going through and all of us at some point have said that we've said God if you really cared about me then why did mama die if you really love me, then why is it that my marriage didn't work out? If you really love me, why is it that it seems like everybody happy but me? But understand something, child of God, in your maturity, in your walk with God, write this down. It rains on the just and the unjust. I'm preaching to somebody in here. It doesn't make you more godly to say that I've never been through anything or all of my bills are paid or all. Because, see, you don't get to know God and God doesn't get to know you until your back is against the wall. I can tell you that I've seen Christians that where their bills are paid, they're one way shouting all over the church but as soon as hell hits their life then all of a sudden their head is bent body bowed and they don't even know who God is show God who he is in your life by preaching and praising him regardless of when things are good or bad by giving him a praise whenever things are right or wrong and that will rebuke the devil and show that he has no power in your life because not only is he Satan the adversary of God but he is also the devil meaning the slanderous one come on somebody meaning he slanders this Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 says it perfectly 
perfectly. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungered. And when the tempter, somebody say the tempter. When the tempter came to him, and somebody put it in the comment section for me, the tempter. I want you to see this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God. And one of the greatest tools that the devil has is making you question your walk with God. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody already. Come on. You, you, you said, you know, I'm never going to smoke cigarettes again. I'm never going to drink again. I'm never going to lie. I'm never going to sleep with anyone that's not my husband or my wife again. And you mess up and you do the very thing that you said you weren't going to do. The devil jumps right on you and tells you, look at you. You're nothing. You're sorry. You're no good. Don't you let the devil convince you that one mess up can push you back. Come on, somebody, and make you not a child of God. The devil is a liar. If you had to be perfect, come on, to be a child of God, none of us would make it in. How do you become a child of God? By saying to God, God, I worship only you. I forgive me of my sins. I believe in Christ Jesus and you're raised him from the dead just for me. If you said that you are saved, yes, you're going to mess up from time to time. Yes, you're going to lie or, 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 or do something, but the point is not to be perfect. The point is try to be. I'm preaching, boy, I'm preaching already. I, I, I get so sick and tired. Lord, deliver me from Christians that think that stuff don't stink. I'm preaching. That think that they have always done right, that they've never messed up, that they're the only ones saved, that you want to point your finger because somebody else got a pass. And what I hate about Christians is this. I love Christians, but some of their ways I'm preaching is that we have amnesia about our stuff, <laughs> but we have long memories about other folks' stuff. We want to remember what you did and how you did it and who you did it with. And the only reason you know what I did is because you were at the party too. I'm preaching already. And, and so um, the devil is Satan. He's the devil. He's slanderous. But then also last week we found out that he is also Lucifer meaning the day star or the shining one. And what this basically means is the, the, enemies, the enemy's appearance and I want you to hear this now, can seem attractive. Uh, get over this fact that when you see the devil it's going to be somebody in a red suit with horns coming out and a tail and a pitchfork that you can easily identify sometimes the devil will look just like your best friend somebody say preach Frankie I'm about to because <laughs> that's what I was born to do listen you got to be careful because the enemy will present himself as a friend it was a friend that invited you to the party where you got drunk for the first time. It was a friend that introduced you to the woman that you ended up having the affair with. It was a friend that told you it was okay to do the thing on the job that got you fired. Amen, lights. And that's why one of the greatest tricks of the enemy Amen. is to masquerade as a friend. Yes, that's right. and, and that's why, you know, in, in my old age, I keep my circle tight. Amen. I, 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 I preached this a couple of Sundays ago. I don't have makeup years anymore. In my 18, if I lost $10,000, I'd have years to make that up. If I lost a relationship in my 20s, I had years to find a new one and cultivate it. At my age now, I don't have the years that I had to make it up. And so now, come on, somebody. I have to be careful that I don't allow the devil to steal the little joy, the little money, the little peace that I have now. I'm preaching to somebody. And so one of the greatest things that he does is to appear alluring. And listen, it can be attractive to see someone living a life that you want to live. But um, the Bible says I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God and than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And if the only way I can have those things is by deceit and by lying and tricking and stabbing somebody in the back, then I'd just rather not have them in Jesus' name. Amen? And so that's a recap of where we last week. And so um, he is called Satan. He is called the devil. He is called Lucifer. But then he is also called the tempter. What we just read in Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 was that he is the tempter, which literally means, somebody put this in the comment section for me, the one who tempts people for the purpose of enticing them to sin. 
Now, what is sin? I remember when I was going to Rockbridge Grove Free Will Baptist Church, I would hear this word sin, and our pastor, the Bishop Robert L. Douglas Jr., would give examples of sin, but they were sin in his finite mind. But here's what sin is, and I want you to write this down, get it, understand it. Sin is anything that separates you from God. Don't try to label it. Don't try to ask yourself is, is, if it's a sin, if I do this, if it's a sin. There was a song years ago said that if loving you is wrong, preach Frankie, I don't want to be right. Well, well, anything that separates you from God or from his purpose in your life is a sin. Anything that takes your peace away, anything that takes away your joy, you got to be careful with because these things will lead you down a path. But anything that separates you from God, Come here, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were in the garden. Serpent approaches Eve, tells her to eat the fruit. She knows the word of God because she repeats it back to him and says, no, God told us that we cannot eat of that tree of knowledge and life. And uh, if you do, certain things will happen. And the serpent says, he knows that's not true. You're going to eat it and nothing happens. You're going to be fine. She trusted the word of the devil more than she did God. Now, you can talk about Eve if you want to, but you listen to the word of people more than you do God all the time. God will tell you you are a child of God, that you are wondrously made, that you are everything he ever called you to be, that if you can just hang in there, he's going to bless you immensely. And one friend can come up and tell you, girl, you don't got the education to get that job. You're never going to get it. And you will spend the rest of your day just consumed with what they said and not what God said. Eve eats the apple. She gives the apple, not the apple, that's not in the word of God. She eats the fruit. She gives it to her husband. And what do they do? Then immediately they hear the voice of God in the Garden of Eden. What do they do? They hide. See, before sin, they would have embraced him. They would run up to him. God, we're so glad to see you. It's been a great day. I named two animals. I, I watered three trees. I got this. I got a lot done today. But the moment the sin entered their life, all of a sudden now, they didn't feel like they could see God anymore. They were embarrassed to be in front of them, and all of a sudden, that relationship was fractured. Notice that when you mess up, the first thing you do is stop going to church. When I get it right, I go back to church. When I get myself together, I go back to church. Listen, if you listen to me this morning or this, this evening or on this Zoom, I want you to hear me and hear me good. I don't care if you got drunk in the parking lot. Come to church. I don't care what you did last night. Come to church. If you are the only sinner in church, that means you're the only one sitting in there. And that's from the pastor on. Come on, somebody. Don't wait the church to get it together. Let us help you get it together because all of us are trying to get it together ourselves. Sin separates you from God. And I hear people that ask me all the time, God seems distant. I feel like I'm empty. I feel like I don't hear God's voice anymore. I feel like I can't find him. I feel like he doesn't come see about me anymore. Listen, God does not move. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What happens is we move away from him because we recognize that we're not who God called us to be. Did you ever think it was funny when Jesus says, when, when the Bible says that when you get to heaven and you stand at what we call the pearly gates, the only thing Jesus is going to say to you, he's not going to say, you sinner, you smoked 42 cigarettes, you slept with half the neighborhood, you cursed out Pastor McLean 32 times and twice on a Sunday, you slapped this person, you kicked the dog. They're not going to go through a list of sin you have. Get out of that. That's television. You know what the only thing the Bible says? He says, turn away from me. You work of iniquity, which means sins. And why do you say that, preacher? I don't know you. That's all he says. He says, we don't know each other. We don't have a relationship. That's what keeps you out of heaven. The fact that you don't have a relationship. Is it not in the word of God? that you don't have it. He says, turn away from me, you work of iniquity, I know you not. Now, this is how you have to read the Bible. Fast forward and say, where does that come from, Asa? Why does he say he doesn't know me? Because he says in Romans, I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were a glistening in Leo Harris's eye, I formed you. He said, I had a plan for your life, Jeremiah 29, 11. I knew what I had in store. You were going to be the best gospel singer ever. You're going to be the most powerful preacher ever known to this world. You were going to start businesses and then uh, fund orphanages. I had plans for your life, but you like weed more than worship. He said, what happened in that your life and to where everything came, became more important 
than me. So because our relationship is not good, because we don't know each other, you go your way <laughs> and I'm going to go mine. And that's literally what he says in the Bible in terms of what sin is. It's simply anything that separates us from God. I, I, I like this. It's important because I recognize that every time I felt empty in my life, I'm preaching already. Every time I felt empty, I mean just empty empty like at the bottom where I just felt like nobody heard me nobody understood me I felt better alone am I preaching anybody in here I just felt like if I could just lay in bed and yes pastors get there too somebody was talking to me tonight about church hurt but we forget that's pastor hurt too Amen. you preaching to folk you loving on them you going to see them in the hospital when you dead tired and then you pastors get hurt too and what you have to recognize is that anytime you're empty it's because you have not allowed God enough to pour into you. Amen. You haven't read the word. You haven't been in church like you're supposed to. You've been pouring out to everybody. And it's something about life when you're the one that everybody comes to. You're the one that everybody looks to for help. Everyone looks to for a word. When everybody looks to for you to be the strong one, for you to be the rock of the family. But what they don't recognize, come on, I'm preaching now, is that sometimes the rock gets weary as well. And so you have to make sure that you're not pouring out so much that nothing is getting pouring in. That's why you got to have devotion time. I'm preaching already. That's why you got to have dedicated time during the day when you get in that word and say, God, pour into me. Come on. When you get in that word and say, God, speak to me. You have to have dedicated time to listen to a sermon. And if you're in church on Sunday, you got to have that time. You got to sit beside somebody that's not going to talk you to death. Somebody that's going to get you to a place where you can hear that word of God. Because a lot of times you'll say, you know, God, uh, I don't hear your voice. Well, listen to the word. And if this is any kind of a preacher and he's hearing from God, God is going to use him or her mightily to get a word to you. Amen. Tell me I'm wrong about it. Tell me you haven't been sitting here on a Sunday and look at the person you sit sitting beside. Did you tell pastor that we were cussing at each other? Did you tell pastor what we we're going through? Because it sounds like he's preaching right to what we're dealing with. I'm not that smart. I'm not that brilliant. It's the fact that the matter is God loves you so much that when I sat down and spent some time with him this week, he had you in mind and put you in my sermon. And I may not even know that's what I said, but you heard it that way because that's how God wanted you to receive it. Amen. And so you have to recognize that there's anything in your life that separates you from God. And so especially if you feel empty, make sure you get some extra sermons in. Go into YouTube and go back to some of our old stuff. Make sure you read the Word of God. Make sure you pray a little bit longer. And by all means, make sure you have some devotion time with God. That means time dedicated, set aside. Uh, we have a lot of our members that have started walking. Can you imagine just walking and praying? Can you imagine just walking and lifting him up and just calling out his name? Your whole day can't be dedicated to TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and soap operas and, and, and TV and movies and all that stuff and, and hearing your gossip of your friends and talking about fellow family members. Your, some of your day needs to be dedicated to spending time with God. And if you want to know why your life is out of order, it's because your priorities and my priorities are out of order. I'm going to help a few marriages out right here. Whenever a marriage is beginning to struggle, whenever the, 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 the marriage is not what it used to be, and people start saying to me, Pastor, we're growing apart, the number one question I ask them is, when's the last time you've been intimate? Amen. I know that's not PG-13. I know it's not true, but there needs to be intimacy, and intimacy is not, you know, what you're thinking it is. Intimacy and conversation with each other where there's no phones intimacy is us sitting down over dinner together not talking about the kids but talking about each other not talking about work just spending some quality time we could be just watching a movie holding hands or whatever but relationship needs work relationship needs intimacy come on somebody and the same relationship needs intimacy is God's relationship with us I'm preaching and ready 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 5 somebody put it in the comment section for me it says for this cause when I could no longer forbear, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, says, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Paul was basically saying here, I needed to make sure that because we had some distance between us, that all the work we were doing, that you hadn't allowed the devil to get in your ear. Come on. 
See, having passion is a wonderful thing until that passion makes or leads you to make decisions that are detrimental to your walk with God. Remember this. If you don't remember anything else, God is not the author of confusion. If there is confusion, God didn't start that. I know sometimes, you know, churches fall apart because somebody said they were working for God and they had a vision and somebody else in the church on one side was working for God and they had a vision and those two visions collided. Understand God, that's not God. Hmm? One of those two visions ain't from God. If you can't control it, it's not of God. I'm preaching to somebody. I remember one time I was pastoring and, and the word was about to come forth and I was preaching a revival and um, the whole church was ready for the word, we standing up and stuff and one person was shouting and all these things and I get it and for 10 minutes passed and the pastor didn't say anything and I wasn't a pastor so I just stood up and gave my scripture and, and we went on into it. As soon as I stood up that person stopped and sat down and somebody said well wh wh why don't you just let him go, why you quench the spirit and I said did you notice when the word stood up that person sat down because there is no scenario where God is going to allow the word to stop being come forth. Amen. Amen. So obviously that person was with God because as soon as the word started coming forth, he recognized it. Now, if you're telling me that your shouting is so important that you're going to shout over everybody else and the word can't come forth and all that stuff, then I really got a question of whether that's God or not. Come on, somebody. The next thing that we talk about the devil or a way the devil is described is, write this down, is the ruler of the world. Y'all heard that, right? He's the ruler of this world. Yeah. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Yeah. The ruler of this world means that the enemy's approach is not isolated to individuals. He has a collective cultural and global methods designed to derail entire nations and people groups from God's intended plan. And to me, one of the ways this is seen now is in our politics. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Now we're talking about issues and somebody will say, well, if you're not on one side of this argument, you're not a child of God. If you're not on this side of the political spectrum, then you're not of God. If you're on this side, you know, be careful because God never wanted us affiliated with a certain political party anyway. Amen. God says, listen, <laughs> this government, I'm the one only theocracy chief Boom, boom. For God I live. And for God I die. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, notice the wording that's used here in Second Corinthians blinded the minds that's the devil's workplace are you with me if the devil can get in your mind hmm? it don't matter how strong you are how blessed you are if your mind says you're not if you allow your mind to just run with anything that's why and listen to me and listen to me good on this uh, I want you to get in shape physically. I want to get in shape physically. I want to run marathons. I, I really don't, just saying, but all that stuff. But get your mind right. Hmm? Get your mind right. If you, if you don't take care of your mind, that's why the Bible says that when you clean out a room, this is Bible now, when you clean out a room and get everything out of that room, you leave an empty room. And you have to be careful because the devil will go back and get seven of his friends and fill that room. They use it as a mind analogy saying that it's not enough just to clean your mind of your past and all the issues that you've done. You've got to fill your mind with good things, whatever things are pure. Remember that scripture? Whatever things are good, whatever things are wholesome, those things are the things that you ought to be thinking of because an idle mind is the devil's workplace. That's why, child of God, you can't just sit at home all the time by yourself. That's why you can't just sit there and be miserable 
miserable and reflect on every bad thing that's ever happened out of your life. Listen, let me give you some coping mechanisms, some Christian coping mechanisms. The next time you find yourself alone focusing on the problems of your past, what mama did, what daddy did, what your first boyfriend did, what your uncle did, I want you to get out of bed, put your clothes on and go drive somewhere. Go watch a movie. Go to church. Go do something. But don't just sit there and wallow in that because that's when the devil can convince you that nobody loves you. You'll never be loved. Your life will never be anything. And that's when suicide and folk giving up on the church and all those things creep in. Am I right about it? Come on. Come on. I'm preaching to somebody in here. It's in your mind. You have to fill your minds with good things. If the devil says, you know, uh, don't forget, you know, you, you, you lost all your money in 2021. Yeah, devil, but I got it back in 2024. Come on, somebody. Uh, uh, you know, you lost that relationship. That person hurt you really bad. Yeah, but that bad relationship led me to this relationship. You got to speak to the devil. Remember when the devil was tempting Jesus, Jesus didn't just let his word stand. He spoke to them based on the word of God. Amen. Come on. And so he's the ruler of this world. But then also he's the prince of the power of the air or the prince of darkness. Have y'all ever heard him call that way? The prince of darkness. This means, write this down, that the devil does not work alone. Now people get upset when I say this, but I want you to hear it. When the devil fell from heaven he didn't fall by himself he had some followers he had some imps he had some fellow angels that when he got kicked out God said oh no <laughs> take your followers with you and don't let the door knob hit you come on Fred G. Sanford help me preach this thing where the good Lord preach it the devil has angels the devil has folk working on his behalf. The problem is, and I hope you hear me on the right way, is that we assign people when really they don't know themselves that they're working for the devil. Amen. They themselves don't even know that what they said hurt you so bad. They themselves don't even know that they're uh, uh, hurting you and your family and got you where you can't sleep at night. But the devil does not work alone. He is the chief leader of a tribe of dark forces. Come on. He seeks to carry out his purposes in the domain of darkness. He's a very real yet invisible force. Come on, somebody. Don't take my word for it. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. I don't want you ever to take Frankie McLean's word for it. Let me give you some word on it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Put it in the comment section for me if you would. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit, watch this now, that was the past, and watch how it comes into the present. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You ever notice that there's some people that just, just they just can't do right? If you sit beside, don't say nothing, but I'm just telling you. All of us have my family. All of us, they come to the family reunion. All, I'm preaching. They just cannot do right. It's just not in them. And, and it's funny because I laugh and I preach about this guy on the movie Life called Can't Get Right. But the truth of the matter is all of us have those people that just say, I don't, no matter how hard I try, I cannot do right. And what you need to do for that is you need to give yourself to God and let God lead you. Let God, and, and all of us need to learn how to ask God before we move. Before we take a step, before we go in any direction, before we make a decision, you need to ask God, God, is this the right decision for my life? I'm preaching to somebody. I use this example all the time, so let me use it again. When, when, when David comes to Ziklag, he was going to work with the Philistines because he felt like the enemies of my enemies are my friends, so they had turned their back on him, so he's going to go fight against the Philistines. And the Philistines are smart dudes. They were like, look, bruh, we know that that was you that tried to kill us just two, three chapters ago, so now how are you going to come up in here and try to be fired beside us so you get on up out of here? But they went around him, and before he got back, they destroyed everything he had in Ziklag. So when he gets to Ziklag, he he sees his stuff burn, his family and his children are all gone, and the people that are with him look at him and say, look, if it hadn't been for you, we still have family, we still have belongings, and so he gets so upset that he wants to go flap gas, come on Orange Juice Jones, every single person that had anything to do with the Philistines. But he does something so smart that we just read over it. Before he does that, he tells his man, go get my ephod, go get my robe. 
I'm going to church all by myself. And he goes to church. It's in the text. And he says to God, God, I'm upset. I'm mad. I want to kill everybody. I don't know what to do. I'm so angry. My family's gone. But before I do what David wants to do, is this what you would have me do? Amen. Should I pursue? Am, am I right about what my Bible read is? Yeah. Or, or should I just stay put? Should I stand still? Should I be still? And God says, pursue, and he gives him a little bit of an addenda, Lexi. He said, and you shall recover Amen. everything. Amen. Now, the reason I believe God threw that part of it in there is because for the first time in your life, David, you're finally listening to me. And I just ask all of you, where would your life be? Some of the biggest disasters that we've all had in our lives, where would we be if we would just said, God, is this you? I'm mad, I'm upset, I want to go to blows, I want to swing on somebody, but I'm asking you right now, is this you? Should I do that? Should I kick the car? Should I pack up all my stuff? Should I curse my boss out, his boss, my coworker, the cubicle over the next cubicle? Should I slap everything on the way out of here? Should I put this in my pocket? Should I sleep with this? Well, God, is this you? I'm preaching in here. Imagine where all our lives would be if we just took the time to ask God that simple question. God, should I pursue or should I sit still? And it's not always bad stuff. God, should I start this business? Should I take this promotion based on money? And so many people have made decisions based on money, based on titles, based on things that sound good, and then ended up wrecking your life. Huh? Before you say, I do, you need to say, hold up, let me go back and ask God, should I say I do? Because sometimes people change and you grow and you need to make sure that you're married to somebody that's going to grow with you. Amen. Yes, Man, I'm preaching in this place. Amen. Let me give you another example of this prince of the air, power of the air, prince of darkness. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Here it is. This is one of your foundational scriptures. Make sure you put this in your phone. Put this somewhere where you can read it because this should be one of your foundational scriptures. You ready? For we wrestle not. Yeah. Stop right there. Let me, let me give you the Frankie McLean interpretation. You're not wrestling against people. Amen. People are not your fight. Amen. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Amen. It's not your boss. He's not the problem. Huh? Amen. It's the devil trying to use him to keep you from getting something. That God, your pastor is not your problem. Come on, your deacon is not your problem. Your, your spouse. Amen. Not your problem. And you know, the devil will convince us, if I hadn't married you, I'd be happy. If I had married Leon instead of Leo. Sorry, Leo, I, that was a mistake. Let me, I, I, I had me talking to Sister Harris, that was a mistake. Let me back that up. Hmm? We've all said that, right? If I'd have just, if I, ooh, I should I wish I'd never met you. We say stuff like that, come on. Your fight is not against people. The devil just uses people. And I have to tell myself that as well. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Come on, where my Bible read is against principalities, comma, against powers, plural, comma, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, comma, <laughs> against spiritual wickedness, this is my favorite one, in high places. President, governor, pastor, come on, CEO, COO, people that have the ability and some influence over your life, you got to watch that the most because see, if the devil is speaking to them, come on somebody. That's why you got to pray because your fight is not against people. And we always do that. We assign that, you know, I had the worst mother. I had the worst father. I had the worst this and that. No, pray that spirit off of you and say, you know what? The devil got into that person and, you know, and that's what they did and that's where it led. But I'm going to forgive them in Jesus' name. Because I recognize that the devil is busy. The devil employs people that are not covered by God or aware of his tricks. And so they'll say things. Because the devil put in their ears, say it. Oh, I'm going to say it. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I say this to people all the time. Why, why did you say that? Because I had to say it. They had to hear this. They had to, no, no, they're going to get this right here. They're going to hear this. No, uh, they're going to hear this. Uh-uh, they, they said it publicly. I'm going to say mine publicly. They're going to they're gonna get this. No, 
I'm looking at them, don't say it, don't say it. Uh-uh, they're going to hear this. Tell me you hadn't said that. They're going to hear this because I'll feel better. I'll be mad all day if I don't say this and I hold it in. And then as soon as you say it, somebody tap Lexi. She's getting married soon. I want her to hear this. As soon as you say it, you'll never get it back. I have said some stuff based on wrong information. And now you sitting there looking stupid. You call me black. I did not say that. I said your shirt was black. Oh, now you done talked them down, you done ran them up and down now, and now you can't get that back. Once you said, you can't pull it back. Your first lady said to me one time, I had to say it. And I looked at her and said, did you? You had to say it. I'm preaching to somebody. Huh? The devil is also, well, his last one for the night. Uh, let me get two more and then we'll be done. He's also the accuser. This is a good one, right? He's the accuser. What does that mean, Asa? It means the one who condemns. What does Romans say? Eight, uh, I believe it's uh, chapter 8, verse 1. There's now no condemnation in Christ. Ken, what does that mean? Think about this. The devil will convince you that after you mess up, you're unusable. And the Christian faith, um, let me take that away. The church is the only religious organization that we kill our wounded. We take folk that are messed up. We want them out the church. We want them off the deacon board. We want them out of the pulpit. You messed up. You did this. You touched them. Now you out of here. You done. You'll never ever be used again. But listen, if God is omnipotent, and omniscient and he called them you mean to tell me he didn't know that they were going to mess up going to make a mistake he still called them and one of the greatest things that the devil will convince all of us to do is throw people away be careful be careful when you start throwing folk away I'm, I'm, I'm not saying you got to trust them the same way you trust them before. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is be careful that we don't just start throwing people away. Amen. Because somebody gave you a second, a third. You know, we used to preach this song, he's the God of a second chance. And I would never sing that part because I was like, oh, I'm, I need more chances than that. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm preaching. Come on, AJ, help me preach. I'm praying that he's the God of 432 chances. Amen. I'm, I'm praying that he's the God of 17,481 chances because I'm going to need a few more. And can I get a witness? Is there anybody else's testimony in here? That I just pray that he's not just the God of a second chance, but he's the God of enough chances that I can still make it in. But the devil will condemn you, and the goal is for him to cripple you to a point where he doesn't have to say anymore that you're not worthy. You will say it yourself. They'll come to you and say, hey, we'll consider you for a deacon. No, no. No. God told me you got a call in your life. No, uh, no. Some woman will come up to you and say, oh, you cute. No, no. I'm, I'm preaching to somebody in here. Am I right about it? Revelations chapter 12, verse number 10. Put it in the comment section for me. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Notice this is a day and night assault. That's the word of God. What does that mean? The devil doesn't take any time off. Hmm? If he catch you not sleeping at night, he'll work on your head all night. Am I right about it? That's when you got to get out of that bed. You got to go down on your knees and say, not today, Satan. You will not take my sleep. You will not take my joy. You will not take tomorrow because tomorrow's not promised. You got to learn to turn everything over to God. And then finally, and most importantly to me, is not only see the accuser, but he is the father of lies. I preached a whole sermon on this. Some of y'all might remember when I preached and the topic was the devil is a liar. But it also means falsifier. He'll make stuff up. Hear me on this. He'll make things look one way to you. 
You ever walked in a room and the table got quiet and you convinced yourself they talking about me. I've had a couple I've walked in a couple rooms but the point is is sometimes we make ourselves more important than we are. And they won't talk about you. They won't even on their mind but you know the devil will get in your ear and he wants you to turn a whole cafeteria up. He wants you to ruin relationships. He will always seek to falsify and to deceive. He will blatantly and unapologetically misconstrue the truths of your personal reality and circumstance. He will also seek to mislead you with inaccuracies regarding God, his word, and his plans. John chapter 8 verse 44. Ye are the father, ye are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Come on, God. And abode not in the truth. Because there is no, watch this, truth in him. Huh? When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Now, juxtapose that to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, the NIV. For I know. Now, I preached on this for 20 minutes. I know. You might not even know. The I in here is who? God. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. My plan is to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So that means even if God says no, it's part of his plan. Even if God says not yet, it's part of his plan. If God hadn't healed you yet, even that is part of his plan because he's going to bring about a day when your healing gets glory, gets him the glory. Come on. So he's not only the accuser, he's the father of lies. Did y'all get anything out of that tonight? Amen. Amen. Listen, if you're watching us online, we thank God for all of you that came to be a part of this tonight. Maybe that word was exactly for you, but you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to offer you the opportunity tonight to make Jesus yours, but simply repeating after me, Father, forgive me of my sins. I believe in Christ Jesus, and I believe that you raised him from the dead just for me. If you said that, congratulations, you are saved. Maybe you're saved, but you don't have a covering. You don't have a church home. We would love for you to become a part of our church family. Um, just come to church, 11 a.m., or fill out something in the comment section, and one of us will get in touch with you really, really soon. But if you don't have a covering, make sure you join Apex First Baptist Church or a local church in your community. Amen? Amen. Thank God for you. Amen. We got a word tonight. Listen, we will see you next Wednesday right back here uh, or Friday morning for our 7.30 a.m. connection call. But thank you so much for coming. Thank all of you for you in the sanctuary. It was so good not to be by myself with a camera. Amen. And to have some people in the sanctuary. So thank God for you. Be blessed. Have a wonderful night.